It's a tough time to be a White Sox fan, which is admittedly most of the time. I can be frank, I'm tough on the South Side faithful because I think out of all MLB teams' fan bases, their loyalty is tested the most. With just one division title in the past 15 years, it's hard not to think of the 2000s as the quote-unquote glory days for the black and white. Several winning seasons, three playoff berths, one of the most underrated World Series winning teams ever, eccentric manager Ozzie Guillen, two of the greatest right-handed sluggers ever in Frank Thomas and Paul Kinnerk, and a beacon of consistency on the mound with Mark Burley. One figure had a quick brush with greatness while towing the rubber, but saved most of his notable stories when he was away from the baseball diamond. Today, we're going to be talking about the tumultuous and controversial career of Esteban Loaiza. The Mexican native is the second winningest pitcher in that nation's history, trailing only the great Fernando Valenzuela, but the legacy he leaves behind is tattered with off-the-field fiascos and plenty of brushes with the law. Today, we're going to break it all down, and if you enjoy today's video, leave a like on the video and subscribe to the Jolly Off channel. We're getting painstakingly close to 100k and you can be the sub that tips me over the edge. Do you want to be Mr. 100k? Hit that red button below. Let's go. Also, a quick note before we get going, this video is going to heavily reference Scott Miller's 2020 article for Bleacher Report all about the career and story of Esteban Loaiza. Now, I had to leave out a lot of secondary details, so if you want the full go or just want to read that story first, the link is down in the description. I highly recommend it. It is well written. Esteban Loaiza Loaiza first signed an amateur contract with the Pittsburgh Pirates back in 1991 out of Tijuana, Mexico, and he cruised through the minor leagues in three seasons, making his debut four years later. He led the league in games started in his rookie year, but also led the league in earned runs, and certainly had some growing pains pitching for a Pittsburgh team in the mid-1990s that was putting up losing seasons year in and year out. Loaiza was actually teammates on the Pirates with a friend of his from high school, fellow Mexican pitcher Jose Silva. The two stuck together with Loaiza helping his old friend assimilate to American culture, and a new language, and even helped him find a place to live as well. Silva noted later on how much this meant to him, and how much of a mentor Loaiza was to other younger teammates. When Loaiza's career took him from Pittsburgh to Texas in a 1998 trade, he began seeing team success for the first time in his career, helping the Texas Rangers win the American League West title in back-to-back -back seasons from 1998 to 1999. In his lone playoff start for them in Game 3 of the 99 ALDS against the Yankees, Loaiza dueled Roger Clemens, and despite pitching six shutout innings after allowing a first first inning home run, it wasn't enough to help the Rangers avoid a series sweep on their home turf. Despite his own personal success and the team's success, this was also the first time that Esteban Loaiza's name reached the tabloids for all the wrong reasons, as he was linked to a woman named Ashley Esposito, the 19-year-old nanny of teammate Ivan Rodriguez. While the future Hall of Famer was quoted saying he took no surprise or issue with it, the larger problem was Loaiza's already existing marriage to Teodora Verasso from just three months prior. Whether you view it as anyone business or not, it did attract negative attention to the team. Add in some personal feuding with Juan Gonzalez and overall poor performance from Loaiza himself, and you've got another trade, this time sending him north of the border to Toronto. In the deal, the Rangers quietly acquired the 1997 fifth round pick from the Blue Jays, an infielder named Michael Young. He went on to collect over 2,000 hits and seven all-star nods as a Texas Ranger. Were you expecting a Michael Young cameo in this video? Many Blue Jays players remarked how influential and helpful Loaiza was in the Toronto clubhouse. Rodrigo Lopez, an 11-year big leaguer and fellow Mexican pitcher, noted that Loaiza was, quote, always the kind of guy who took care of rookies and his countrymen. In 2000, when Loaiza was acquired midseason, he had his best run as a big leaguer to that point, pitching 92 innings with a 141 ERA plus as a Blue Jay. He was their best pitcher down the stretch, but 83 wins wouldn't be enough to crack the playoffs, and in 2001 and 2002, he regressed back to his normal stats. His ERA settled over five in both seasons, though he continued to be a workhorse, pitching at least 150 innings in six of his first eight seasons. But by the time he had free agency after the 2002 season, Loaiza's market was virtually non-existent despite being a starting pitcher. He was forced to settle for a minor league contract with the Chicago White Sox, a squad that had finished with a 500 record the year before and was looking for their first playoff berth in three years. In addition to the acquisition of Bartolo Colon, the South Side boasted a completely new looking rotation. Working with White Sox, Sox pitching coach Don Cooper, Loaiza was able to revive his dwindling career. He had learned to throw a cutter when he was a Blue Jay with pitching coach Gil Patterson, but avoided throwing it due to fear that he may harm his throwing elbow. When he came to Chicago's south side, Cooper helped him conquer that fear as the cutter became Loaiza's primary pitch. The change in production was instant. In his first month, Loaiza went 5-0, pitching to a 1.25 ERA in 36 April innings, walking just five batters. In late June, his ERA still sat below two on 
on the season. In mid-July, he was not only named to his first All-Star game, but was shockingly named starting pitcher for the American League squad. Best of all, it was taking place on the White Sox home turf. I mean, this is basically a lost relic in baseball. A guy that couldn't even touch 90 miles per hour on his fastball was starting the All-Star game. This basically has only happened one time since with R.A. Dickey in 2012, and that guy was a knuckleballer. As Loiza warmed up, Joe Buck remarked on the telecast that he could guarantee, quote, We've never had an ovation that sounded like that. And he was probably right. 50,000 fans in the stands, over 200 countries watching, Loiza had become a national sensation in the span of three months. His harnessing of the cut fastball had taken him to new heights. After tossing two scoreless frames against the best the National League had to offer, Loiza finished the second half strong. The 2003 White Sox were rolling, tied for first place in the AL Central as late as September 14th, before fading in the final two weeks of the season after getting swept in Minnesota at the hands of the Twins. The offense was powered by a dynamic trio of Frank Thomas, Maglio Ordonez, and Carlos Lee, while the pitching staff was spearheaded by Luiza himself, Bartolo Colon, and Mark Burley, all of whom pitched over 225 innings with an ERA plus better than 110. For reference, not a single pitcher threw over 225 innings this year, and the White Sox had three of them. As for Luiza specifically, he placed runner-up in AL Cy Young voting after never getting a vote prior. He received two first place votes, but lost out to the dominant Roy Halladay of his ex Blue Jays. Still, Loiza's ranks among American League pitchers in a steroid laden league was beyond impressive, including leading all American League pitchers in strikeouts and placing top five or better in ERA, Fangraph's War, Whip, Batting Average Against, and Soft Contact Percentage. Bear in mind, the pitchers he was competing with in addition to Halladay included Tim Hudson, Roger Clemens, Pedro Martinez, Johan Santana, and Mike Mussina, all of whom he outplaced in awards voting. Esteban Loiza's 2003 season was simply magic. It was awe-inspiring, but it was also hard to replicate. Through his first 14 starts of the following season, Loiza was still solid with an ERA under four, but he was far less consistent than he had been the year prior. He managed to earn another all-star nod, though not as the starter this time. The White Sox sputtered into that year's trade deadline, losing seven straight games to fall around to a 500 record, and decided last minute to become sellers. They were able to save $3 million on their payroll and replace Loiza a spot in the rotation, trading him to the New York Yankees for Jose Contreras. Jose Contreras, who had gotten boxed out of a rotation spot in New York, became an integral piece of the White Sox championship team in the season that followed. As for Loiza, he was looking to aid a rotation that appeared dominant on paper, but was failing to live up to expectations. However, Loiza proved to be anything but a savior. He had finally found consistency in New York, just not the consistency you want. He couldn't manage a single quality start during his time in the Yankees rotation and was bumped to the bullpen come September, but the Yankees still won 101 games and the American League East Division title. In the playoffs, Loiza actually pitched pretty well as a reliever with just one run allowed in eight and a third innings, but he'd get the loss in game five of the American League Championship Series, a 14-inning affair that the Red Sox won to send the series back to New York, where they'd complete the only 3-0 playoff series comeback in American sports history. So yeah, Loiza's brush with the pinstripes involved being on one of the most infamous teams in that franchise's history. But speaking of franchise history, he found a home in Washington on a one-year $3 million contract to be a part of the inaugural Nationals team. Him, John Patterson, and Levon Hernandez led a surprisingly productive rotation, as the squad finished with a 500 record despite placing last in a tough National League East. Just when Loiza's value had plummeted yet again the year prior, he was able to save his career on another one-year deal. This time, he turned it into a three-year contract with the Oakland Athletics worth over $20 million. He used some of that money, $50,000 to be exact, to fund a Padres project to build baseball fields in his hometown of Tijuana. Loiza never played for the Padres, but Loiza's time in the green and gold was an instant disaster. At the end of July, his ERA was approaching seven as the team hovered around 500. It didn't help that the month prior, Loiza spent a night in jail after getting pulled over driving over 120 miles per hour in his Ferrari and failing a sobriety test. Thankfully, no one was hurt, and Loiza ended up pitching the very next day, beating the Seattle Mariners in a quality start. Longtime A's broadcaster Vince Cochineo put it maybe too lightly, saying that Loiza was just a knucklehead guy with some decent stuff upon occasion. While the latter half of that was true, this was the beginning of a pattern of destructive behavior, and it would only get worse from here. Aside from a stretch in August and September where he allowed just two 
two runs in four starts, 2006 was ultimately a year to forget for Esteban Loaiza. His team won 93 games, and he did make two playoff starts for his new club, but this would be the last high note of his career. His fastball velocity dwindled to a paltry 83 miles per hour on average, and he battled back and shoulder injuries through parts of 2006 and the remainder of his contract. He bounced around to the Dodgers and had a reunion with the White Sox in his final go in 2008, seeing his 14-year career end at age 36. Despite the longevity of his career and the stardom attached to that famed 2003 season, Loaiza somehow ended up in more headlines once he finished his career in the spotlight of baseball rather than when he was actually playing it. At first, it wasn't anything that was getting him in trouble. In fact, his first headline had him more famous than he had ever been before. In 2010, he married Mexican-American singer Jenny Rivera, who sold more than 15 million records in her wildly successful music career. The two originally met at one of her concerts and became Mexican national royalty, with the star couple even receiving spots on the Las Vegas Walk of Stars in 2011. The marriage, however, lasted just two years before the two filed for divorce, shortly before an untimely passing for Rivera in a 2012 plane crash. Had the couple not been separated, someone close to Loiza says he almost certainly would have been on that plane. He finally went quiet for the next five or so years of his retirement. He'd pop up occasionally in White Sox media or Mexican baseball, but nowhere near the headlines he was getting in the 2000s. This could have been for the best, if not for what was coming next. In February of 2018, Esteban Loaiza was arrested in California after police found 20 kilos, or about 44 pounds of cocaine in his home. The amount was estimated to be worth around $1 million at the time of its discovery. This all likely would have gone undiscovered if not for a traffic infraction days prior, where the police noticed a sophisticated compartment used to conceal contraband in his vehicle, which led to the acquisition of a warrant. Just two weeks prior to his arrest, Esteban Loaiza was at White Sox Fan Fest, a favorite among the crowd there. Nearly 15 years after starting the All-Star Game, Loaiza was set on a path towards a life behind bars. Despite making over $40 million as a baseball player, Loaiza confessed that he was indeed out of money. He pled guilty to the charges, acknowledging his possession and intent to distribute in the plea deal. In 2019, he was sentenced to three years in prison and was deported out of the country as a result. He was released early in 2021. Since then, it's been crickets, and that puts to a close one of the most controversial and intriguing careers in MLB history. Even after 14 years, 125 wins, over 2,000 innings pitched, and getting the ball in the All-Star game, it seems as though Esteban Loaiza's lasting legacy will be all the things he did away from the baseball diamond. It's easy to forget how much fortune and fame can alter one's decision-making, especially if they're an individual coming from somewhere foreign who maybe didn't have as much earlier in their life. Many athletes have made many dumb mistakes in their careers, but it's different when it reaches the magnitude of what Loiza did. Possession of narcotics, driving under the influence, these aren't crimes to be taken lightly, and this is what his legacy leaves behind. He assuredly could have done things differently if given another chance, but we can't change what's now become a gripping career story, full of all the headlines we can't help but love to read about and hope that we're never part of. And hopefully his career can stand as a lesson of what not to do when you reach the pinnacle of your craft. That'll do it for this video though. If you guys enjoyed this story, make sure to leave a like on the video and consider subscribing to the Jolly Olive channel. That's all I got for you. I'll see you guys next time.